Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Early Care Connection. I'm Izzy Greenberg. We are joined today by our resident panel of experts, Meryl Gay from the Connecticut Early Childhood Alliance and Ava Bermuda Zimmerman from the Child Care for Connecticut's Future Coalition. Uh, I would like to start by thanking Sandra <clears throat> and reminding all of our guests to speak slowly so that she can interpret for uh, the many people who rely on her. Um, okay, special guest this morning is Commissioner uh, of the Office of Early Childhood, Beth Bai. She is on to talk about the Blue Ribbon Panel uh, report, which is out, it's final, uh, it was released on Friday. We'll put the link to it in the chat so that everybody has it if you haven't had a chance to look at it yet. Um, it's very long and very thorough and uh, and she's here to tell us all about it. I want to just, before we start, remind everyone that this is now a final version. There's no more changes. So any questions uh, that lean in the direction of uh, try, you know, can this be changed? No, we're not gonna, I can't deal with those questions today. So questions today, um, I want to see things like you, you say this, you know, how do you plan to implement it? Or what does implementation of this look like? What is this money going to go to? Those kinds of questions that are future thinking, uh, those are the ones that we're going to prioritize this morning. So I just wanted to tell you that now so nobody feels disappointed if I don't ask your questions. Um, but of course, uh, please use the chat to communicate with each other, uh, to share things amongst the, the community here that we've built. Um, and uh, use the Q&A for your questions for the commissioner, but please wait just a little while until she's had a chance to do some of her presentation uh, in case some of your questions are able to be answered. It helps me to not have extras in there um, to weed through. So welcome everyone, welcome commissioner. Thank you so much for being here um, all along and we're um, happy that you could be here to present the final report as well. Well, hello. I am really happy to be here uh, with you all and happy to talk about the report. Um, I know our team just came back from a national meeting around building early childhood systems with other states from around the country that received preschool development grants. And they came back and talked about how having an office of early childhood, you know, really gives us a head start. Um, also talked about how our um, input that we get from our advocacy community and this back and forth really helps us to be more responsive to what's happening in the field. So I don't take these Monday calls for granted. I know what it takes to put on a webinar. So I just appreciate the, the effort to, to bring this information to providers. I see we have more than 200 on the line. Um, I started my day providing childcare for my granddaughter this morning, and I was just making sure I had no drool on my shoulder. She is uh, six months old last week, and uh, it's really been a great reminder um, about how just incredible these years are as you watch a baby develop and grow and how critical the work uh, yeah. that you're doing is. Um, I also have to mention that last week with the governor, uh, we went out to the family childcare home of Maria um, Amadio. I hope I'm saying that right. Uh, Ava, correct me if I'm not, but uh, to walk through an incredible family childcare home with the governor, um, he was really taken uh, with the quality um, and the warmth and the joy of the children. Um, it's just been a great collaboration with providers uh, and with the advocacy community. And I know Maria has been a great advocate as well. So people who work all day with children doing that critical work, take time beyond um, their work day to make the system better. So as I start, I'm gonna start talking about the Blue Ribbon Panel plan. Um, I'm really grateful to, just let me know when you see it. I'm really grateful to the yep, Blue Ribbon it. Panel Members, uh, can you see that? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, really grateful to the Blue Room Panel members um, because I think with their guidance, um, we helped set up a process that was incredibly community informed. They kept asking for more information. Uh, providers, advocates, and family kept asking for more venues where they could be heard. And so when I think of the Blue Ribbon Panel plan, I really think it represents some of the best thinking in the state and some of the best thinking in the country. Um, 
Uh, Lynn Kagan had a chance to read it and had some important feedback, but really thought this is a big undertaking and it's incredible all the feedback you got and this group is part of why we did. So I'm gonna walk you through it and then I'm happy to take questions. Um, and uh, Meryl and Ava and Izzy, feel free to interrupt me as I'm going if something is not clear, because I've talked about this so much that sometimes I just skip right over things that are super important. Um, so I'm going to start. And just as a reminder uh, to everyone here, we will post uh, the recording of this after this presentation on earlycareconnection.org. With that, we will post the Spanish audio feed the chat uh, and Q&A if there's information in there that you need, and also this presentation from the commissioner. Great. Um, let me just start um, with the outreach. Um, we heard from almost 900 parents with a lot of support from community-based agencies and foundations. Um, we heard from community stakeholders. Uh, we heard from businesses, and we heard um, from 71 different communities. We held um, 282 meetings and we had uh, 2,000 um, total engagement. Um, I'm going to, I know Eloisa from my office is listening. I'm going to ask Eloisa to make sure this is the final version of this slide because I believe it was closer to 3,000 by the very end. So I just want to make sure this isn't an old slide and that, that we have the most current event. But no matter how you slice it, um, this was a community informed process. It was a community organizing effort. And uh, we have a lot of folks in Connecticut um, who have taken time to make it better. Um, out of that out of that work uh, came four primary goals. And what was very clear is the very first goal is workforce. Um, I think what you'll see as we roll this plan out is that the quality piece is going to be a little more pulled out than it than it feels here. Um, because we know workforce is really tied to quality that, you know, anyone who's a parent knows the quality of the teacher in their children's classroom, um, is the key component for success, a successful school year or childcare time. Um, uh, but we also know there are pieces of quality that, um, in and of themselves are super important. So, um, I think because workforce was just overwhelmingly the topic we heard about, that that ended up swallowing up quality. So just know that um, it's a high quality ECE workforce and also we need to lean in on supporting quality um, programming as well, because the return on investment that I'm gonna talk about today does not happen unless you have high quality settings and um, we know we can do better there. The second goal is um, having equitable and affordable access. Um, we heard a lot from certain kinds of families who had trouble accessing childcare, uh, particularly around children with special needs and families with transportation needs and in areas of childcare deserts. Um, so uh, really gonna focus on equitable and affordable access. The third goal is to improve our systems. I know, um, we have systems now, but they tend to be old and clunky and challenging. Um, and we know that for this to work, we could plan the best system in the world, like the best workforce, increase access. But if OEC and the state doesn't have the systems in place to make it work, it doesn't matter. You know, you all know when we get backed up in care for kids, we can be talking about affordable access. But if parents are waiting two and three months to get a certificate, that's not really access. So the systems have to work as well as uh, equ equity and workforce. And then um, as it often does, it, it comes down to um, funding. You know, So we know that there's a need for additional funding uh, for this to work. And in the current budget, as proposed, the governor's Budget has 50 million ad additional dollars now in there uh, already in additional funds over, we're in 24 now in 25. Um, but we also know we need, you know, a combination of federal, state, philanthropy, business funds to make this work. Um, this doesn't come as a surprise to any of you, um, but when you put the 
importance of those early years for brain development up against how we pay our childcare workers, um, it just doesn't make any sense. You know, the, the people teaching 17 year olds are making way more than the people teaching one year olds and look at what's happening there in terms of the child's brain. Um, so the Blue Room panel um, was really struck by this fact and really leaned into understanding that compensation has to be um, key in any strategy. And the way that this plan gets there is, sorry, I went a little too fast. The way that the plan gets there is through increased rates. Um, I know there are different states and municipalities have different strategies on the wages. The strategy here is to bring up the rates to lean into some more stabilization to help programs that are still getting back on their feet after COVID, um, to enhance uh, care for kids rates, to let more families access care for kids so that supports more programs, um, and to increase those rates. Um, this slide is quite something. When you look at Connecticut, before families have children, um, the male and female labor participation rates are virtually identical. And then when you add in uh, children, families with children under six years old, I should say less than six years old, um, there's a 26% gender gap. Um, I always laugh at this slide because I think, wow, the men really get in the workforce after they have a baby. I'm like, I'm out of here. This is too hard. <laughs> Uh, but um, we know, I know, um, like in my case, uh, my son ended up taking leave and, and, and his wife worked because of the, the way the income works in their family. Um, but anyway, this gap is something we're concerned about. And Connecticut has a 100,000 person um, labor shortage where we need 100,000 workers, 90 to 100,000. And so improving access to child care could really help with that problem. Um, the United States is really near the bottom here. Um, over the weekend, I just have to tell you the story because it was unbelievable. Over the weekend, I was at the um, FDR Museum and Val Pill, which is Eleanor Roosevelt's home. Um, and there was a whole um, civil rights exhibit that will blow your mind. And, and really for being at the FDR Museum, does not shed a positive light on FDR in terms of the progress he was able to make uh, with race relations. Um, but it also talked about how different social programs that supported families. And in the exhibit was a 19, it was like 1929 letter um, from Eleanor Roosevelt to an advocate saying, I'm so sorry we could not re-up the maternal infant care bill um, that was in place um, because we can't seem to get uh, the support uh, that we need for it. And there seems to be, uh, and it infringes on states' rights, and there seems to be opposition from the Catholic Church. So I was thinking, 1929, this was an issue. And, and sometimes it feels like we haven't come that far. Um, but to hear her talking about, I think it was called the Sh Shep, there was like a Shepherd Act where there was funding for maternal and infant health that included some child care that then went away. I, I'm, I shouldn't speak because I probably don't have it exactly right. But I just sat there reading this letter written by Eleanor Roosevelt, apologizing to a constituent that she couldn't move the country on maternal infant health. And when you look at this chart, all these other countries have figured out how to care for mothers, fathers, and their babies and their young children, um, except the United States, who else is with us? Ireland, Costa Rica, Turkey, and Cyprus. Um, but when you look on the far left and see the percentage of GDP that goes to supporting uh, young children, we are really behind. I, I have this slide in a presentation for the governor. I'm meeting with him this week. Um, so I do believe states have a chance to distinguish themselves and um, move their state's economy forward uh, by addressing this. Um, but it's been a problem for a long time. Many of us have lived through many iterations and hopes 
Um, but I don't think we should give up hope um, because there's there's really, I think the Bloom Panel Plan really lays out a strategic vision and takes uh, things in steps um, to try to address this problem. Um, but it is a cultural United States issue, period. Um, this gives you an overview of what's happened to the budget since 2019. I think all of our brains always go back to 2019 because that's like the year before COVID um, hits. Um, and you can see that these are the appropriations uh, and the, uh, the, the, the ones with the stars, 23, 24, 25 are appropriations. Um, 19 to 22 are actuals because the statements have been able to be audited. Um, but you can see that uh, a lot of this, thanks to the efforts of, of this organization mm -hmm. and others, um, between the legislature and the governor, the funds um, for on our child care line items have gone up 57%. It's really not quite right that that federal fund has an arrow pointing there. We've got to fix this slide too. But at that same time, the federal funds coming to Connecticut for child care have been up 69% too. So the funding, there's been more funding, and yet we still have a real child care crisis. And um, sometimes that's hard to explain, you know, when you're talking to policymakers. And I'm sure you hear it when you talk to your legislators. It's like, oh, we just did this last year. We just did that last year. We've just increased funding. A and we have. But the problem is the issues are so entrenched and so they're decades and decades and decades of underinvestment going back to the 20s, really, um, and an undervaluing of care work and the care economy um, that even with these investments, um, I know many of you who run programs are still really struggling uh, to get by, to recruit staff. You have empty classrooms, even though you have kids on waiting lists like there's still big problems, um, even with these additional investments. But I do think it's important to take stock and say there have been significantly um, large investments in early childhood uh, over the past five years. Okay, on to our objectives. And what so what does goal one mean? What does that break down to? Um, it starts 1A of this whole report is... We need to support professional compensation in order to have a strong early childhood workforce. We need, you know, and that's probably the top strategy for 1B. If you have better wages, it's easier to recruit and retain people. Um, but we also need strategies specifically to recruit and retain folks. Um, I went to talk to an early childhood class at Tunxis a few weeks ago. It was really fun to meet these 20-somethings all really excited about working in early childhood. Of the eight students, six of them got in interested in early childhood because their high schools had a child development program that they took. They took a child development class mm -hmm. in high school. So that kind of thing really helps recruitment because if kids are exposed to it, it's such a great field. I, I would never trade my field for anything after a 40-year career. It's been wonderful working with young children. Um, we also need to simplify our credentialing process. Um, and we're, we're talking about um, aligning with the unifying framework um, and making sure as we do that, that we are not leaving our current workforce behind. That um, when there was significantly increased investment in public education, there were a lot of communities where the current workforce was left behind. And we want to be really careful in early childhood that as we adopt something like the unifying framework, that it's a community informed process and that we uh, make sure we create pathways for the existing workforce that came through again and again um, to uh, help early childhood programs uh, maintain their fiscal health uh, and uh, help them increase compensation and then uh, continue our efforts toward quality uh, early childhood and improving the quality of programs with programs like Elevate licensing, professional development, accreditation support, um, family child care networks, uh, family child care accreditation support. So we've got to have those systems in place and accessible and logical for folks as well. So those are the workforce and quality objectives. 
on equitable and affordable access. Um, this is about ex improving affordability for low and middle income families. So there are two steps there. One is to move toward a 7% parent cap. Um, we have to do that thoughtfully in ways that don't negatively impact providers, but the idea is that no family pays more than 7% of their income on childcare. Um, the other way is to expand access to care for kids from say 50% of SMI, now we're at 60% of SMI, SMI, hopefully getting to 70% of state median income um, to increase uh, the number of families who can afford childcare. Uh, obje objective 2B, which I know you all are up, up against and know about, is just an extreme shortage of infant toddler care. That came up everywhere we went, particularly with families. Um, and it's hard for programs to add infant toddler classrooms because they're not very profitable, if at all. It's usually the preschool classroom supporting them. So we need uh, to expand the state-funded infant toddler capacity through Care for Kids and through expanded um, state-funded child care. Um, we also really need to work with the public schools and focus in on addressing this problem of families that have children with special needs not being able to access early care that their child needs and that they need to work. Um, and then uh, we have a lot of under-resourced communities that are child care deserts where families can't get to what exists because they don't have transportation. So uh, looking to increase access that way. So it starts with the workforce. Then we go on to making childcare more affordable and accessible for families. And in fact, those things work together because those of you out there who have empty spaces know that maybe if more parents could get a subsidy, they could afford childcare instead of some informal arrangements that they're making um, right now. Just wanted to, this really blew our minds. We we looked at the data and and we looked at this, looked at the Alice uh, report and grateful to United Way and members on this call who've helped uh, publicize that and talk about Alice families. They're asset limited families, those who are sort of just on the brink of poverty and can barely afford to get by. Um, and this is what would happen if we went up to just for example, 75% of the state median income and offer childcare, uh, those families would save $25,000 a year on childcare on average um, for a three person household and 24,000 for a four person household. So, and you can just see as you go up the line, you know, a family making $80,000 a year gets $25,000 back that helps them afford a house, uh, transportation, um, all those kinds of things. So um, this is a really uh, just sort of shows in goal two, if we're able to get to 75, 85, and then by year five, 100% of the state median income, um, we'd be helping a lot more families. Um, so that's not nothing. Um, next is the systems objective. Um, to make our systems more flexible and responsive to family need and to program need. Um, the objective 3A is to create a more simplified state-funded system. I know for the past pretty much 10 to 15 years, we've been talking about aligning our early childhood programs, trying to get the rules the same, et cetera, but that's just not the same as having one program. And we have some programs in the state that in one classroom can have kids from four different funding streams. And it just gets super complicated and burdensome. Um, so um, we wanna move to a simplified single state funded system uh, to reduce the complexity and make it more useful, even for families. You know, just once you get these things aligned, let's say in, in the ideal is as this plan moves forward, we get all the state funded programs and care for kids aligned with um, for families on who qualifies for what and what is 7% of your income, you know, the parent fees get aligned. Um, it becomes much easier to have a single point of entry as a state and simplify things uh, for families. Uh, the second goal here on the systems is to uh, better align uh, systems, reduce administrative burdens and help 
uh, programs and families access our state uh, systems. So um, there are a bunch of you, I bet, out there now who are helping us um, pilot OEC 360, where we're trying to have a single point of entry where you can get to all your systems and see how much you've been paid over the year and see what's pending um, with background checks all in one place. And we're trying to do that in a way that's very slow. So we're getting user research before we pass it, uh, before we start with the whole field. Um, so we've gone from 10 to 100 to 500. We were going to go to 1,000, but the 500 told us we had to do 500 more first to figure out more user testing. But um, we need our systems to work better. We can't, I talk about number one, reducing administrative time. If our systems uh, don't work better, then that takes a lot of administrative time from directors that could be spent supervising classrooms, playing with kids, talking to parents. Um, so we sort of want to get out of the way and improve our systems. Um, in any system, we want to make sure that family voice is heard and represented um, in what in whatever governance system um, is is rolled out. And then we have to improve our data systems. Um, and and also with that, for example, um, we want to have a common needs assessment for communities. So we know what community needs are, and then you can better build the system, but we don't have any kind of feedback like that right now. We've sort of been doing the same thing since the 60s and the 90s, and, and Care for Kids has sort of, uh, the federal funds have made us uh, do some things that actually have improved our quality and systems. Um, but as a state, we haven't really updated our system in decades. Um, and the final goal is uh, building a well-funded, sustainable early childhood system that can let is ready to leverage future investment. Um, I think objective 4C is, you know, uh, one worth uh, mentioning here strongly, which is other states who've been able to implement significant early childhood investments have done so by identifying a sustained funding stream. Sometimes it's gambling, sometimes it's uh, cannabis, sometimes it's a sugar tax, sometimes it's a payroll tax, one state's using energy futures, but the states that have been able to make ongoing sustained progress, as the Blue Room panel studied it, found they had some identified funding stream. It wasn't just a fight every year in the general fund, uh, in the state budget arguing for funds. So, um, and Connecticut has a trust fund set up. It only has a dollar in it, but um, I know some of you were engaged in that work last year. And, and so that's there. Um, we also wanna have a more flexible fiscal model that where, where we, um, we develop a model where we know if we add access here, what are the implications for the budget? What are the implications for quality? How do we make sure quality and access are both um, are both working together, that kind of thing. We think that um, over the next year or two, uh, having a fiscal model as we you know, look to stabilize and then grow the system um, is really important. Um, and then uh, we're talking about moving from market rate in terms of setting our subsidy rates to cost of care. And other states are doing this and we're gonna work with other states and the feds to move toward a cost of care model. So these are the recommended investment totals to do all those things I just talked about. Um, on the right, uh, you can see the number of um, children served uh, and you move from 50,000 up to more than 80,000 children having access to affordable supported childcare. And on the left, you can sort of see the actual needs. So we're coming into year one. Um, and I think I told you sort of, we already have more than 50 million assigned there. And then uh, over the years, as access increases and rates increase, um, the numbers get higher and higher and it starts to flatten out really in year five. And that number there is about $603 million. So um, you can see uh, 
there would be a 60% increase in subsidized slots. And what we're recommending, what the panel is recommending is to start with stabilization in year one and two, and then move toward once you you know, you have to get facilities in place, you have to get the workforce and program stabilized um, before you can, you know, really grow the system. So you can see how from fiscal year 26 to 27, the budget really ratchets up and that's where you get to the expansion part. And then over that same time, the stabilization funding goes down. So there's stabilization funding recommended um, for all five years, but as the rates come up, the stabilization need goes down. And then this is something we just really finished last week. I'm sorry, it's a little blurry. I'm hoping you can, it's not so blurry that you can't read it, but this is, if we took year five, this is not cumulative. This is just in year five, if that many more families were served uh, with childcare and high quality childcare, um, there would be uh, a savings, a, a, a economic benefit to the state of um, more than three and a half billion dollars. And so if you look at what's being expended and what the value is, it's sort of a seven to one benefit to cost ratio of investing in early childhood. And the number down below are looking at the cohort of children in year five. This is all year five impact. Over the course of those children's lifetime, um, the benefit would be uh, 7.5 billion. So those are the ones we talk about a lot. There's improved school performance, reduced special ed, uh, reduced incidence of child welfare, reduced incident with uh, the corrections system. Um, and so there's a lot of payoff here. So I'm going to stop here and take questions. And if there may be other screens, I'll share. If particular questions come up and I can pull something up, I'll do that. But really, um, thank you for your patience while I walked through that. And I'm open to questions. And um, and as, as Izzy said, uh, this is done, but it's never done because this is a process that has been going on since 1929. There will be legislative input. There will be changes in federal rules and there'll be changes in federal funding. And um, we can't predict everything. This is the Blue Room panel's best projection of what is needed. And then the governor's got to look at all that's on Connecticut's plate this year and um, what parts of it the state can do. We have to look for federal resources. We're, we, we're hoping philanthropy and business will play a part as well. Um, so that's where we are now. Thank you. <clears throat> I am first going to turn to Meryl, um, who, who thinks about policy all the time and <laughs> probably has some complex questions that I might not have thought of. Meryl, why don't you start us off? Okay. Um, so I guess my questions are just trying to understand uh, what the plan's calling for. I'm looking at page 57 in the plan, which is the, the numbers. Um, and- um, uh, Real quick, folks, I will put the link one more time into the chat. So if people do want to follow along, you can do that. So um, under the the first section is stabilization and systems building, and then the next one is expansion and sustainability. Mm -hmm. uh, and the first line there is expansion of affordability and related care for kids rates. Um, in year one, it talks about it, it says forty seven million. What what were you expecting you you'd be getting for forty seven million there? Okay, I just put it up on the screen yeah. for those. Okay, Great. so. It's important to separate um, there, there are two parts of care for kids. So um, the 47 million is for expanding is expanding the SMI that more families get access to care for kids. And so over the course of the five years, there are 24,000 slots 
I don't have that. I, I, I could break that down, but basically it's about a thousand dollars a month, a child on average for care for kids is a little less than that, but you can do the math to get back into how many um, children that would be in the first year. But so this is all about expanding access. The number that's about um, affordability is a zero here, which is about the rates because the rates are in the current budget. Okay. Um, and I can, I'm sure that I can, I can, uh, well, I can yeah, tell I'm you what, let me just tell you what's in the current budget. Um, the current budget for rates has, um, $39 million. Okay. So, so this would be 47 million on top of the 39 million. 39 million for rates and 47 million for access. So I was, guess what I was trying to figure out was, was that 47 million to address weightless issues and make it easier, you know, speed up the getting people on, or was it actually increasing the eligibility limit from, you know, 60% to something higher? It's that plus that helps with the wait list issue, right? Because yep. if you open up access, you open up space. Um, so it all helps uh, with the wait list as well. Okay. And, and right now I don't believe we have more than a month's wait on the wait list. Right. There are some pretty substantial processing delays at Care for Kids. Yes, there are processing here. delays, not... Yes, which yeah. are indeed access delays, but they yeah. will qualify and get on and be paid back to when they, but we do know that and, and we are working on that. That's what I meant about the the systems piece, right? That's got to be working. I remember in one of the public meetings, you talked about exploring the idea of a sort of presumptive eligibility or mm -hmm. some sort of temporary while we're processing stuff, getting you on. Um, is that included in these or what? Oh, presumptive, looking at presumptive eligibility is part of the ongoing systems work. It's not included in year one under stabilization, but it is in the report and it is part of looking to that. Uh, and and the feds, the, the federal government based on our most recent, our team's most recent um, CCDF conversations uh, it's also on the Fed's mind, so it could end up being a requirement at some point. Uh huh. Okay. Um, so I guess the other uh, sort of big picture question is: at year five, when you're spending 292 million more on care for kids, um, is there a sense of sort of what percentage of the young children in care would be touched by subsidy? Well, the the number up here, there'd be a 60% increase in the number of children on subsidy, and, well, in subsidized child Spaces. care. Yeah. yeah. So I'm just trying to do the math there. So right now we have between state funded, let me try to get to the, the number. Um, it talks about 80,000 um kids in subsidized care as opposed to 50,000 now. So by year five, if the plan were implemented as designed, there would be 30,000 additional families receiving subsidized, or 30,000 uh, children, 30,000 additional children, which is probably 26,000 families and 25,000. Mm -hmm. Okay. I want to, I know Ava also has a question. Mira, was that the end of that question? Yeah, I was just trying to be, um, this clearly will help the families who are touched by subsidy. I'm just trying to get a sense of, all right, how many folks are still outside of the system and in the, well, the right. staff who serve those families, yep. the, the only way they get a raise is if parent fees go up because right. if they're, you know, yeah, the other piece not to forget is that the state funded spaces, those programs are 60% of families under 75% of SMI, but 40% of those spaces are available to all families. Mm -hmm. So that's like, um, 
that'll be like 17,000. So 40% of 17,000 could serve other families who make above 75% of SMI and are really challenged. The other piece is the start of TriShare. We don't know, you know, that's proposed and we don't know if it's funded and start started, uh, that would also cover families um, who are working for businesses that are willing to pay a third of their child care bill um, matched by the state. There'll be some income limit or asset limit, more like income limit, I bet. Um, but we're working that out. So that is meant to be a way also to help um, purchase slots and community-based child care programs by businesses um, who will match parents in the state to pay for child care. So that's another way. So yes, it's mostly targeted at families under 100% of SMI, which um, I go to my it's very handy chart. Like 127,000 um, roughly, if I'm remembering. Yeah, it's 127,000 for a family of four. So the plan expects to go up there for a family of three, it's 107,000. Doesn't mean that families that make more than 100,000 aren't struggling, um, but... Mm -hmm. I was just thinking more about from a pro provider side, if I've got a classroom that's um, got that's either a subsidized classroom and one that isn't, um, and I'm getting more for the subsidized classroom uh, if, to get, I get between the, the state subsidy, say for an infant toddler or CDC uh, classroom with care for kids on top, I get more money out of that than the classroom that just has market rate and, or maybe I do, uh, but the issue of how do you, um, when you have mixed funding streams, how do you give your staff a pay raise that's equitable across the staff when you've got, well, only this classroom is getting that subsidy um, and the ability to be able to um, raise wages is limited by how much you can charge your market rate customers. Um, you know, you don't get care for kids for uh, if your if your rate is two hundred and fifty dollars a week, for instance, yeah. um, and care for kids says we'll pay two hundred and seventy five. You have to raise your rate to two seventy five. Um, yeah, I mean, I think in the short term, the 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 blue room panel suggested, for example, in year one, it's. 70% of the system, that is 70% of classrooms would get uh, $55 million in sort of the, the kind of uh, stabilization payments that we've been making to help with wages for all programs. Now, there 30% that won't. And, and I will tell you, we know that there are 30% of programs that are mostly doing okay. We know mm -hmm. most are not, Yeah, but there are some that are. And then in the second year, that goes down to 46 million. The third year, 47 million again. So the stabilization is really for three years as more money for the private provide, you know, for private programs that may not be state funded. Um, and the reason the number goes down is that as the state funded rates go up, then they will no longer receive stabilization. And the stabilization dollars will be reserved for programs that don't have access to the state funding mechanism where the rates will be going up, then the stabilization grants will be going to the programs that are not state funded as the, you know, as state funded rates go up. That's why those numbers change. Um, like segue, segue into that and, and going a little deeper, Rhonda Knowles read my mind. Rhonda um, asked a, a question about what happens to programs, uh, similar to Meryl's question here, what happens to programs that are not state funded? What happens to programs that do not receive any kind of subsidy? Um, a continuation on that question, the recommendations have, um, they have some, some wording about support with health insurance and other resources. So I'm just curious to hear um, what, what the thought is on that and how we can get additional supports to those programs. Yeah, uh, that that don't have any uh, state funded. Um, I'm so I'm so subsidies. glad you asked. I'm so glad you asked that question. Um, uh, first of all, there are the stabilization grants that will continue um, to seventy percent of programs, and and also continue with private programs for longer than they do with the state funded programs. To understanding, they're still going to have workforce challenges. 
Um, we also, uh, uh, with the Blue Ribbon Panel Plan, have asked for three healthcare navigators to help childcare um, programs um, find the affordable childcare, uh, healthcare for their workers. Um, because we realize that a lot of the workers qualify for Husky and cover Connecticut, and there may be guidance to private insurance that is more affordable. So that is one way. The other way is um, we've asked for, I think, two and a half or three and a half million dollars in um, coaching support. So that would be available to all programs where we want to build coaching capacity within programs. So to have cohorts of coaches um, that are supported. So teachers and programs um, can, uh, can grow their skills to support other teachers and get a stipend to be a coach. That would be open to all programs as well. And um, we just think that any way we can support private providers with things like business supports, which we've been able to do, and that's open to everyone, um, that, that those make a big difference. The Family Child Care Network, the accreditation support, those are available to all programs. Thank you. Commissioner, I know you need to leave. Um, I and... do. Oh, I'm so glad you <clears throat> looked at the clock. It goes so fast. I know. I know. Um, There's a lot of questions here. I'm sad that we can't get to them all. Um, yeah. or to many of them. I know Meryl and Ava try to prioritize what it, the questions that I'm happy to come back folks. in January. That would um, be awesome. Yeah, I'm happy to come back in January. And um, I just urge people to read the report because I think as we build the health of the whole system, it helps the whole system. As we help more families access childcare subsidies, more families will choose formal care. Um, and, and we can... Um, support ongoing quality improvement for all programs, access to higher ed and workforce pipelines supports all programs. So um, I'm happy to come back in January um, and address those questions. I'm actually gonna be off for a couple of weeks caring for that little baby, um, but Elena uh, is available as needed. And uh, I hope everybody has a wonderful holiday uh, season. I think it's the fourth day of Hanukkah, is it the fifth? Or sunset is the fifth. Sunset the fifth is sunset. the fifth. So happy Hanukkah right now and um, enjoy the holiday season. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thanks so much, Commissioner. Enjoy your holidays. Yeah, bye-bye. Okay, so we still um, have a few more minutes. I don't know if there's any uh, comments, breakdown, any things that you see in the Q&A, uh, Ava and Meryl, that you may be able to answer. Um, from reading uh, it, I know you probably yeah, yeah. looked at I'll, it more closely than most folks at this point. So go ahead. I'll, I'll take a stab at the first, the very first question that was um, asked by Anonymous at 951. Um, the question was, uh, just to summarize here, because it's kind of long, will there be a way to distinguish between the dollars uh, that they're using for this plan versus ARPA? The, the question and answer is very easy. Yes, the easiest way to distinguish is that the ARPA money is going to be spent down now. Right now that ARPA money is being used for um, grants like LISC. And I know that the the window to apply for that just closed, what was it, a week ago, Meryl, for, for the LISC grant. Um, so the money that's coming in for, or the proposed money that's coming in that the commissioner just presented has not been approved. This plan and this recommendation was sponsored by OEC and the governor's office uh, but it has to go through the legislative process in order for that money and all those wonderful things that the commissioner mentioned to be real. So very clear dis distinguishing moment between ARPA money that's happening now, that finalizing and sunsetting. And then when the legislature does approve more money, all these programs that were mentioned could be real. Yeah. Um, there was a question here about... Um... Other than care for kids, it sounds like all the stabilization funding will go to state pro programs. Am I hearing correctly? No. Um, in the um, the stabilization, they're planning to get to roughly 70% of the programs. Um, so those would be um, ones that are in the 
not in the wealthiest communities, basically. Um, so 30% would are considered to be stable now, and the other 70% um, it are, are challenged. So in the first two years, the state-funded programs would be eligible to get some of that money, but that starts to diminish because they will be getting money in a different funding stream through increased uh, rates. And the for the remaining three years, the it's only private programs that are getting the uh, stabilization funds. And that would be, pro when I say programs, I'm inclusive centers and family child care. Right. Are there other questions in here you feel you can answer? Let me give you one minute to look those over. Well, there's a handful of questions about who will qualify on the subsidy and how many more children would be um, accepted into your programs. Uh, there's someone who I think Amy mentioned, uh, for whatever reason, currently she has a decrease on care for kids um, children coming in and qualifying. She doesn't quite know why, whereas in the past she had more children on Care for Kids that did qualify for Care for Kids. It seems that the commissioner um, you know, is proposing that the Blue Room Panel plan would allow for more children to be on the system. Um, you know, un unfortunately, it doesn't, it, there's no magic uh, or crystal ball to let you know who of the children um, in, in your space right now would qualify because we're really waiting on that legislative approval, approval for funding, right? So these proposed plans um, would increase in slowly up to 100% of SMI. But if the state decides to say, well, we're not going to put that much money into the system, then it, it'll, it could potentially be a different percent. So Amy and folks, um, if you are looking to have more care for kids, children in your space, uh, then we got to do our, our darnest to advocate for more funding and make that happen during session. Yeah, that's um, this is just a plan. It's not real. Don't count on it yet. Uh, we need to make sure that there's money behind it. And that's going to be the legislature appropriating funds. Um, and, um, you know, if it is, um, if it's funded, then there would be a larger percentage of the parent population eligible to get Care for Kids help paying for care. And one would assume that would then mean more customers. Um, We're reading, folks. Yeah. I know there's, <laughs> there's a lot of a, questions here. Of... So I'm looking <laughs> at the insurance navigator. Um, so Connecticut has Husky, and then it has a sort of in-between step that is, um, I'm trying to remember what what the name of it is, um, but it's Covered subsidized. CT? What, what was that? Cover CT. Covered CT. Yep. Right. Um, most people don't particularly understand it, and that the, uh, the insurance navigator would help with that, help families who don't qualify for Husky, but can still qualify for some help paying for um, care. Um, and that's, you know, that's essentially helping people access stuff that they're already eligible to for that they're not taking advantage of now because it's the system's too complicated to figure out. You know, on that that question and example, Meryl, um, as someone who was an, an assistant navigator with the state for three years, um, and specifically spent a lot of time with providers um, helping them do applications. It is night and day uh, when, when you have someone helping and walk you through the process. Like I had uh, out of my goodness, in the course of three years, um, I serviced 17,000 people um, it, through the process of getting health insurance. And I would say easily 50% of those people had no idea they qualified for any kind of state subsidy. So you might be there, you know, hearing this and thinking, I don't qualify for any type of um, health insurance state help. Uh, the question is, you know, have you tried? And then the other question to that is, 
did you uh, appropriately fill out your application? Because things like deductions, you don't have to add in as income. You know, a lot of providers in my initial uh, conversation about health insurance with them, they put in their full income, their full, you know, exactly to the cent of how much they make with their child care children. And that is not how the application should be made because you are self-employed. So definitely take advantage of the navigator um, if and when that program starts. Another question that I see here, um, the community college question. So anonymous at 1015 says, does the plan increase qualified staff who have degrees to align with the um, UF Connect uh, Connecticut State Community Colleges. And then uh, Rosalie, sub you know, subsequently below that, asked another question and comment about Norwalk campuses cutting over 200 sections of their, their curriculum and, and uh, available classes in 2024. So um, for those of you who are currently looking into uh, community college programs or have staff that you would like to go back to school, and are concerned about what's happening in the state system, um, I, I could assure you that the commissioner knows about it. In our steering committee conversations, there have been discussions. Um, panelist member Carmelita Valencia Day, uh, who works with, uh, she runs the early care program in New Haven, is a very big advocate to maintaining um, early care programs available. She also cre created a program that is available online. So while the state college system is going through some massive budget cuts and crisis, and Rosalie, I hear you, very scary, um, at least in the ECE world, um, it doesn't seem that they're being impacted. To my knowledge, there hasn't been an early care um, education program that has been shut down due to that state crisis of the state, the state education system. And even though a lot of the proposals in the current Blue Ribbon Panel recommendations are future, you know, we have to wait for the legislature to implement them. The ECE classes, that's something that is actually happening now. Obviously the commissioner does want to expand on the resources that providers have and the QIS Elevate program, but they did start implementing some of those changes that they pro uh, propose in the plan right now and providers could start taking advantage of that. Um, so I'm looking at uh, the second to last question here. What about the stable programs that won't receive money, rely on tuition to pay all expenses? How will we pay qualified staff? Um, uh, just jumped. Uh, we're finding we would need to offer $25 an hour um, to start. Our tuition would have to be raised significantly to get this. Parents will choose to go elsewhere. We can't pay staff. We will and are losing staff to Starbucks, Home Depot, Costco. These are people with degrees who are getting more money elsewhere. Any suggestions? So this is where I think we all need to advocate for more than what the Blue Ribbon Panel has proposed. Um, the, you know, if you look at what they've just done in Vermont, they passed a plan that when fully implemented, will um, subsidize roughly 90% of the families in the state and pay providers enough that they can pay living wages to their staff. Um, the That is, to me, the gap here that, yes, it will increase the number of people who are uh, getting a Care for Kids subsidy. It will increase slightly the number of uh, kids in a state-funded space um, through the CDC program for infants and toddlers, um, but there will still be a substantial portion of the population who are not touched by subsidy. And the only way in which programs can raise wages for the staff who are working with them is to raise tuition. Um, and so we will make things better for a bunch of people, but um, there will be a bunch of families that will see higher tuition as a the only way that this works. So I want to, I know there's, uh, unless there are any other uh, pressing questions in there that you want to answer, which you can, um, I also want to just ask 
what happens next for the blue ribbon panel? Uh, this is the final, uh, the final version of their plan. This is now their recommendations. Um, can you describe to us the process um, by which this gets potentially implemented? So for the first step that they took to what happens next is that they delivered this plan um, to the governor's office. The governor's office uh, basically gave a thumbs up, a green light. The governor wrote a letter and you know signed that letter uh, that went in attachment with this plan. Um, now the governor's team is meeting with uh, key stakeholders in the legislature. So the executive branch is now talking to the legislative branch um, and, and I have to say that is happening right now. This is not hypothetical, like it's truly happening. Um, I reached out to, you know, some of our most important people who have a lot of power in the legislature and they're having meetings in the next uh, month and a half before session to talk through what is possible um, to implement in this plan. So then um, those stakeholders, you know, the Speaker of the House, uh, President Pro Temp, so the Senate and the, the House, you know, have a conversation. They figure out what aligns and what makes sense. They talk it through with the governor's office. They hopefully, the expectation is they take this proposal and they present it to the rest of the legislature to approve the money that's necessary for this plan. Meryl, what happens then? <laughs> well, I was going to say, I mean, formally what happens is the governor proposes a budget set of budget modifications. Um, and then the legislature decides what they're going to do with that, whether they're going to pass it as proposed or they're going to change it. Um, it it's clear that this is, you know, a priority of leadership is talking about it as a priority in the legislature. The governor has, you know, obviously put his name out there attached to this issue. Um, so it has to go through um, various Various parts of this plan have to go through various committees. Um, if they're going to change rules or um, processes for paying providers, then it probably has to go through the education committee because that's the committee of cognizance for um, OEC. Um, the appropriations obviously have to go through the appropriations committee. Um, if they were looking at some new revenue stream that would have to go through the finance committee, but all that stuff, uh, there will be um, committee bills. This is a short session, which means that their no, individual legislators don't introduce bills. It's only committees that um, bring bills forward to be uh, drafted and have a public hearing. After the public hearings, um, which probably start late February and go into March, then um, the budget negotiations get serious. And, um, you know, by May 6th, we have to have a state budget passed or whatever the first Wednesday in March, in May is. Yeah. So that's, that's the rough process. And part of that process, part that of that process means all of you who have all of these wonderful comments and passionate recommendations. And obviously you heard from Meryl and I, there was not much opinion given as to what's good or bad. We're just giving you answers because we did have time to read it through. And for you guys, this is new information. But all of those opinions that were part of the, your questions, we have to highlight them, lift them up during the legislative session when we have hearings, when there's an opportunity to write a letter to your legislator. Technically, you can start doing that now. Like, yes. So you can reach out to your legislator today, tomorrow, the next day and say the blue room panel, the governor's blue room panel came out with this plan. I agree with X, Y, and Z, but can you do J, K, <laughs> you know, all the way. So not a, right. don't miss that opportunity. Um, so inviting legislators in to visit your program and have a conversation with them about, you know, this is what the blue room panel said. Um, you know, I like this, this, and this, but this is a, a place where it falls short um, is a good thing. If you have um, a school readiness council 
or a local early childhood collaborative, then you can do this collectively with other programs and other interested parties in your community. Um, that strengthens the effort. Um, I was just at the Bristol School Readiness Council legislative breakfast um, a week or so ago now. Um, we didn't have the blue ribbon panel to talk about, so we were just talking about the issues that face child care programs. Um, it's you, We all have to understand that legislators are not experts. Legislators all have other jobs. Uh, when they are in session, they are dealing with a slew of issues. And if they don't have young children themselves, they don't think about this issue very much. Um, so you need to help educate them and help them understand um, why it's important for their constituents that we do something to improve the situation. Um, and so I, I really do urge all of you to please reach out to your legislators, make sure they know that there's a Blue Ribbon Panel report, um, go download it yourself and read it, get yourself uh, you know, up to speed on things. If you have questions about things, let us know and we can try and answer them for you. Um, but we need to continue to raise the, um, the importance of this issue with the legislators who are going to be voting on something this year. Yeah. Yep. Thank and you. By, yep. Um, what, what, I'm sorry, Izzy, one no last comment. No problem. I have a my, few more things. Okay. My comment and Meryl's comment about it's not real into it's real, um, doesn't downplay the significance of the creation of this document. So it's not real until it's real, and that's, that, that still stands. But the fact that the governor took the time out to start a Blue Room panel and have the conversation at all is a big deal. And this coming from the governor's office as a priority and asking for more money and making adjustments is also a big deal. So by you supporting you know, those additional ideas, it, it, it's, it's bringing it all home. You know, we, we need to bring it all home so they could be finalized and, and be real. Yeah. So Izzy, I, I will stop talking. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would just say everything in this plan is necessary. It's just not completely sufficient to solve the problem. It'll solve the problem for, you know, 30,000 more families will have access to affordable care. Um, but as one of the governor's friends who was on the Blue Ribbon panel asked, well, what about that family at 105 or 110% of state median income? They're still struggling with the cost of childcare, but they're not going to get helped by this. Um, yeah. And, you know, having legislators hear from those families who are paying a lot for childcare now, who probably won't get touched by this, um, is important for get building a group of legislators who say okay well this is good as far as it goes but we need to do more great thank you okay so uh i just wanted to remind folks that the recording of this will be posted on the website in the next 24 hours that's earlycareconnection.org if you have other people that you think want to join this, and I've been getting a lot of messages about that, you can send them to that same website and they can sign up for these webinars right there and they'll get the weekly reminder email. Uh, Meryl also tries to put um, a reminder up on the early care, uh, excuse me, the ECE web uh, listserv Info. every week. Yeah. So that is another place to get information about what's happening. Um, next week, we've got the Office of Early Childhood back again, not Commissioner By, but um, but Office of Early Childhood to talk about changes to care for kids. Am I getting that right? Uh, yes. 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 Okay, good. <laughs> so another important call next week, and then I believe we'll be taking a break uh, for, I don't know, end of the year. It's We always take a break. And so I hope you can, can do that as well. Uh, we'll be back together January 6th, I believe, um, whatever that that first Monday of, of January, that's not a holiday, uh, we'll be back then. So mark the calendar for next week for the Care for Kids update and then uh, a little break until January. Anything else uh, that you guys have to go over before we wrap up? I'm putting it into the chat, but in December, tw on December 20th, uh, CCFCT is holding a 
white paper com community conversation on this topic. Um, it will be uh, a revision, you know, a quick revision of what the Blue Room panel recommendations hold, and then a deeper dive into how we can expand on those ideas and prepare ourselves for that legislative conversation. So I know December 20th that week might be really busy, but as you know, uh, as we try to make sure we're, we're navigating this, uh, these changes correctly and preparing for next year, we wanna make sure that all of you are part of that conversation. So I hope you can make it December 20th, 6.30 PM um, to be part of that community conversation. Uh, that is open to anyone open dialogue, opinions, comments, et cetera. Um, hope you make it. Yes, and always a reminder that Ava and Merrill both each represent organizations that are doing statewide advocacy on early childhood. So this is a, a group effort to bring the information most relevant to you every week, but also these two organizations, Connecticut Early Childhood Alliance and Child Care for Connecticut's Future, uh, both are organizations that you probably want to be involved with to be doing this kind of long advocacy work that's happening all the time behind the scenes. So, uh, okay, I guess that's it, huh? Um, yes, just another reminder that Izzy, repeating what Izzy just said, if you have a friend or if you are in someone else's Zoom feed to sign up for these calls, you can sign up yourself. Um, you don't have to give us your email address. You can sign up yourself or friend through earlycareconnection.org. It's actually not very easy at all for us to sign you up yeah. uh, because it's a Zoom form and you just sign yourself up. It's much, much simpler. Go and ahead, Meryl. Let me just make the offer that um, if you're a provider out there who's thinking about um, inviting a legislator in or having a, um, a you know, legislative breakfast or something and you want some help on how to do it, um, please uh, drop me a line, Give me either call me or email me, and I'm happy to help you with that. Great. Meryl, can you put your email in the sure. chat? I okay. Um, thank you all. If anyone is celebrating Hanukkah, I hope you have a uh, light-filled time with your family. Um, for uh, I don't think there's any other holidays between now and next week, so I'll hold off on the rest of them until then. But um, thank you as always to Commissioner Bai. Uh, thank you as always to Ava and Merrill. Thank you as always to Sandra. And mostly thank you as always to this great community of folks who were here. We had somewhere around 300 people here and I know folks will share the recording after the fact. So um, we're able to really reach a lot of people across the state because you guys show up every week. So um, it's terrific. It's terrific to be here with you and we'll see you all next week.